Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namatasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namatasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Homage to him, the Blessed One, the Worthy One, the Fully Enlightened One. We pay homage to him and his teachings. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay. So I want to start. Um, and, you know, normally I would use the screen, but it's not set up right now. I had like ideas about drawing for this too, but <laughs> I guess I'm not gonna do the drawing because it's too hard for me to set it up this morning. Okay, but, okay. First of all, what is it? What is this forgiveness meditation that Monty started using? And um, where does it come from? Let's, we're gonna talk about that at the end. I'm gonna take a, a, a will answer a question about where does this belong in Buddhism and stuff like that at the end. But first of all, um, this is a circle meditation that he put together. And there were many books coming out about uh, forgiveness. And, it, it, um, and we needed a forgiveness because it does, it is there in Buddhism. And I'll tell you at the end where it is, but um, and we needed a way to work it with our students because students would get stuck. So first of all, what is it? It's a cleaning practice, a cleansing practice is what it is. It's like vacuuming out your head before you do metta, <laughs> what it actually is. You should think of it that way. So the, um, the two uses in particular for this uh, practice is that we started using it as a support system while you're learning uh, loving kindness. And that's where it appeared to be really needed. So you only do the forgiveness um, for, uh, for supporting the loving kindness if you run into a, if you run into a block. That's, that's the way we were using it with twim when we first began. So what happens is you're starting to learn tranquil wisdom insight meditation. You're starting to send the metta, the first one of the Brahma Viharas. You're sending it to a spiritual friend and you're working to bring it up and to send it to yourself. And then suddenly at that point, you might have in the first 10 minutes, you might have a problem with the feeling of the metta in the heart to come up. It might not want to come up or you're, you're starting to practice past the 20, 10 minutes and you have a spiritual friend and suddenly you can't feel um, the metta as strongly coming up for you to send the metta to the friend, okay? So number one, the, uh, the use of the forgiveness we, we have to understand is that it is a, uh, it's a natural part of the loving kindness practice, but it's a cousin. It's not part of it, actually. I say it's part of it, but it's not part of it. It's a separate practice. I want you to remember this because the steps in the, uh, in the practice of forgiveness are different than the steps in the loving kindness. And you'll catch on here as we go on with the questions. Um, the two ways we use it is, to, is as a support when the loving kindness breaks down in the practice of loving kindness. The second way we use it is we make a decision that we wanna do the whole program, the entire program. So what does that mean? Well, Bhante did his entire program for two years and he didn't do any other meditation but forgiveness, that's it. Because he wanted to totally understand it, totally figure out how it worked, and totally understand what happens in it, the components of it, and how it helps you. Okay, so that's why he stuck with it to see how far it could really go. Okay, um, the normal way is when I when I did it, I used it for six months initially. That's when I was in really bad shape in the beginning. And I really, really was starting to learn with him. I used it for six months. And he, he, you know, that was the predominant thing, not using the loving kindness practice the normal way, but just using this, okay? And it's a form of loving kindness because you're being kind to yourself. How do you know? Here's another question. And the, 
how do you know it's time to do it? Well, as I told you, you get stuck in the loving kindness practice for the twim, the feeling of the loving kindness just won't come up. Okay, now this is where you, um, as I said, you don't want to mix it up with loving kindness. It's not, it's not the same practice because the steps in loving kindness, as you know, we tell you to six R everything as fast as you can. Six R everything, just because you're trying to get let go of the past, things that come up from the past, let go of things that come up from the future, let go of everything and see what's left. I one time said to somebody, the Buddhist trying to experience an experience of no experience and see what the mind is like to have no experience going on. It's what it seemed like to me. He's trying to experience the experience of no experience, <laughs> which is kind of talking about nothingness and, and uh, the deeper states, but that's really what he's doing. Because the way that you get to those deeper states is wow, you, you let go six hours, six hours, six hours, keep smiling, keep light, keep the mind and open so that it can, again, go into these deeper states much more easily. Okay, so the question here was, uh, how do you know it's time to do it for the student? Now, if you're teaching someone, you have to spot this. And when you're teaching them, I may have asked that question twice. All right, we'll hit it again. But if um, they say to you, I'm stuck, I'm stuck, it won't come up, it just stopped coming up. Okay, then one of the first things we want to do is we want to try to Go back and send it to just yourself. And we want you to smile more. We want to tell the student to smile more because if you're frowning, you're not smiling, you're not opening here. So it, it was starting in the beginning, but it's, it's not going to work. It's not gonna function. And in the heart is wounded. All of this with loving kindness, by the way, uh, the loving kindness meditation and the Brahma Viharas, they will not operate unless you practice dana, sila, bhavana first before you practice. So now this is, this is an ongoing thing in the modern world of meditation. Some people were so upset with me that I was teaching dana, sila, bhavana before I was teaching sila, samadhi, panya. Oh my, what are you doing, Sister Kama? They called me from Canada and I was in the United States. Well, here's the deal. You can't have sila, samadhi, panya successfully progress with the descriptions that are in the text and have the results of described in the text if you have not first practiced dana, sila, bhavana. So what is the reason for this? Dana is generosity. And the practice of generosity is a generosity of thoughts generosity of speech and a generosity of action okay and that affects your heart so you you are dealing with softening and preparing opening the heart to the practice of loving kindness so if you don't do that first there are going to be some people that it probably won't matter that much but a lot of people are locked locked down uh, in their heart and some people have been going through terrible things and have shut off their heart. So you have to be sensitive as a teacher if you're trying to help someone learn this, uh, that they need to be practicing uh, this dana, this dana sila bhavana first. Sila is the way, is, are the precepts. Keeping the five precepts all the time is going to make it so that this whole process of meditation can work because it's all intertwined. It's all woven together. It's not a bunch of pieces all over the place. And so you have to be keeping your five precepts secure so that the heart and mind will start to get to know each other again, like they did when you were children. And then they'll start to work together better. So that's the picture of that. Um, uh, you know, it's, it, when it's time to do it is when you get stuck. Or if you come from, you've been practicing for a while, the loving kindness, everything's been working all right and everything, but you have a feeling you're having some things when you go in, uh, beyond the fourth jhana sometimes, 
into uh, the deeper states, into the Arupa practice. Um, yeah, right. Then you really need to be have a free flowing thing going on. And some things are gonna come up from the back. I told my student students one time, it was a big group I had. I had gone through all their interviews for the third day and I almost had tears in my eyes. And I came out and said to them, I need to tell you, you are courageous when you come and really want to do this meditation. Because as you do this meditation, you are opening, you are opening your mind and opening your heart and connecting them again. See, in the way that they will all work together. It's all very much with nature and all the natural way of the human being be. But, but in this world, everything is so vibrating and just vibrating the vibration and the, uh, the, uh, uh, the frequency of it is really, 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 really high, you know, like that. And um, you, you want to be able to settle into a more natural thing with nature for the human being to have everything work really well. So you need to relax into this. And when we say relax, we just mean tranquilize. We don't mean, hey, relax. Uh, we don't mean that. We mean tranquilize the mental formation and tranquilize the bodily formation and think constantly that it's okay to do this. So the, these things I'm teaching you will naturally come out. They will naturally be born again. When does it usually happen that a person needs this? Well, if, if you're training, that's another question. If, if it usually happens when I look at the charts and things, I see it happens within the first two to three days of a 10 day retreat. That's where it happens, that you can spot a person's having trouble. Are you having trouble with the feeling coming up? It's beginning to lock down. It happened first, I could do it, yeah, with the first instructions for the loving kindness. Now something happened and it just won't come up. So what do we do first is, like I said, we, we ask them to smile more into the practice. Now, smiling in TWIM gets misunderstood. Uh, somebody said that we teach everybody they have to be happy all the time in their whole life. And I'm there. No, nobody said that. And obviously that doesn't happen to people. It's not what we say. It happens either. We don't tell people that. We tell you that we're talking to you about something we figured out uh, that we would make your car run better. A clutch when you shift gears, <laughs> you know, or something like that. In other words, when I tell you to smile in this practice, I do want you to feel happy and I want you to make it easier for joy to come up, but I'm not ordering you to be happy. I'm telling you, if you smile here, it's connected in a muscle system here that goes in and releases the hemisphere of your brain slightly so that the um, pineal gland can release endorphins and dopamine and things like this into your system naturally. And what, which is what? Which is lightening you, making you feel lighter. And when you feel lighter, the brain can be more accurate to work for you. It sharpens your awareness. So it's all connected. I'm just telling you, don't skip that part of this mechanism or this machine. Don't try to take that part out. One, one time, <laughs> my best friend and I, we used to like to take apart everything when we were in high school. We took apart the telephones once because we wanted to see what Alexander Graham Bell had figured out. <laughs> well, we put them back together. You know. Then one time, well, what happened was we decided to take her father's Mustang car, 1969 Mustang, and take it apart and put the engine, all the parts, label them and put them around the garage. And we were going to, we were, we were going to put them back together again. Well, <laughs> he came home and he just looked at it and, well, he said, oh, oh. <laughs> and then he sort of said, it's okay, <laughs> it's you guys, <laughs> it was horrible, we weren't allowed to go in the garage until he could get the 
whole thing back together. But it was fun. It was. So all I'm trying to tell you is we took it apart. So in the case of the lawnmower, when we did that, we did the lawnmower before we did the car. And but in the case of the lawnmower, there was one piece left. I mean, come on, guys. There was like this. It was like there was like one piece left like this, you know. So I said, well, just it started. So it was running. So I said, just leave it in a cup. So we left it in a cup and something burned out that week on the lawnmower. And we wouldn't tell her father what it was. <laughs> but this is the point. You know, this meditation doesn't work unless you smile okay so you smile the more you can smile and i don't mean smile i mean these muscles that's what i'm talking about these muscles are equivalent to this little screw nut this bolt bolt see this bolt that was left from the lawnmower this this the smile is like the bolt do not leave this out of the equipment it's important okay so um, it usually happens anyway. It usually happens within the first two to three days. We can spot this in an interview and we'll, we'll say to the person, do you feel you can't bring it up? Try smiling. If it doesn't work in the next interview, we're going to put that person in forgiveness. And just we just tell them we're going to change your meditation just a little bit. And, and one of the things that, uh, that happens is that when we change the meditation, the um, um, when we change it a little bit, you have to be very specific uh, to not let go of everything. If you started meta, and then you're going to need to use this, this is what the teacher has to remember to remind the person. In meta, we told you let go of everything. Let go, relax, smile, come back. Let go, relax, smile, come back. Let go, relax, smile, come back. That's what we told you to do. Now. That you're doing that <laughs> and it won't you can't get the feeling now i'm going to ask you don't let everything go until you know there is not someone there and that's where we get into what is donna uh, in forgiveness and i'm going to explain what this generosity is in forgiveness this is a circle practice so you would draw a circle or just put a one two three on a page and the three pieces to this practice, and a lot of people only go one, two, and then that's, they use it and that's all they do. And that's a mistake. And you don't, you don't boss this practice around either. Yeah, we'll, I'll explain it to you. First of all, the first part of the practice is when you begin it, we give you some phrases to say. And these phrases, um, the one we give you the first two phrases that we show you are the ones that just turn seem to work the fastest. The first one is, I forgive myself for not understanding things clearly. And you have to tell the person what this means. <clears throat> this means uh, that everybody, all people do things and they react really quickly. And later they feel really badly because Later on, they know what was really going on, but they didn't know what was really going on at the time that they reacted in the situation. And then they feel badly about how they reacted. See, can, can you identify with this? Can you remember times that you reacted and later you're, oh boy, I was really sorry that I said that or I did that, but I didn't really understand what was happening at the time this was going on. And so that's, that's what you're, you're hunting for, pulling up, you're, you're saying these phrases so that you can get to the second thing, the second piece of this practice. You say, I forgive myself for not understanding things clearly, or the other one, if that one doesn't work, if nobody comes up on that, and usually somebody will come up on that, but if nobody came up on that, you can try another one that's, I forgive myself for causing myself and anyone else pain and suffering. I forgive myself for causing pain and suffering for myself or anyone else. Then stuff will start to come up. Okay, now, <clears throat> the first one, forgiving myself, 
is actually we're in, in concerning on the left of the numbers next to your numbers where you said one, two, three. I just want you to write Donna, Donna, and Donna because all three of these are generosity. All three of these. The first one is forgiving myself. That is compassion and loving kindness directed toward yourself. You are taking care of yourself when you forgive yourself. It's important we for learn how to forgive ourselves and let the pa this past thing, this whatever it is that happened, go and live in the past, stay in the past. That's what you're doing. You're trying to clear out what's caught in your head, caught in your head like inside of a fence up here. And you, when you say these phrases, you're waiting for the fence to come loose and open up and one of them will drop out. <laughs> That's like horses inside of a fenced in corral up here in your head. And they're, they're stuck up there. That's where they, they stay. They're just memories of things that happen. And when we practice, the cleaner we clear out our mind, then these things want to fall out and they're willing to fall out. We will have to giving them a way to fall out of the mind completely and not be there to bother you ever anymore. <clears throat> so the first one is Donna, generosity, because you're giving to yourself when you say this. Now, when the gate gets loose like that, and it falls, one of them falls out, then when that person rises up in your mind, this is why you don't six R them. You just see the person, then you immediately change the phrase and you start saying, I forgive you for not understanding. You have a person from an incident, from an event in the past. You don't think about the story. You don't think about the event. You don't replay anything in your mind. You let all that baloney go, but you feel bad from this, okay? That person was involved. So you say, I forgive you for not understanding. This is from a breakup. This is from an argument. This is from being fired or anything. It could be anything at all. It's war between two nations. Why not forgive? You want an example of forgiveness. You need to look at Rwanda and see what's happening in the country for what happened with the purges that went on there. It's a much better example than looking at the Serbs and the Croats in Croatia. You don't want to look at that <laughs> because they still want to get angry at each other. But Rwanda has given us an example of what can happen in a population if you just forgive and go from here and realize you're living here. And this is the only place that you are alive. You are not in the future. You are not in the past. You are only here and now. You know what? That's not so heavy when you think about it. <laughs> it's really heavy when you start thinking about the whole past. It can get very, very heavy. Or if you're so worried about what might happen in the future, you could end up like Chicken Little, the little chicken that wouldn't follow his mother out of the barn because he was afraid that the sky was going to fall in the future. He didn't know how. And if it rained, he was terrified. He never went out of the barn. He ends up starving in the story. It's a bad children's story, you know, but, <laughs> but it's true. If you never take a risk, you never get a gain, you see? So he needed to go out and learn how to peck the ground and get what he needed to eat, but he wouldn't do it. He was too afraid of the future. So he let go of this. It's not here yet. And this one is gone. So here's the only space you should be worried about packing in your backpack for just today, is today, is this hour, is this, you know, minute. I hate to say the present moment because I feel like you're chasing that on your wristwatch, but that's a useless thing. <laughs> okay. Anyway, let's come back here. Number two is to forgive the other person. Okay, that's generosity, isn't it? That's generosity to another person, being kind to another person. The third thing that happens is if you continue to see that person in your mind, if you can just remember them and see them in your mind, and you think like you're looking right in there, I forgive you. I really do forgive you for not understanding. I forgive you. And when you do that, then you're going to fall over suddenly where they turn around and look at you and smile and say, 
like I forgive you too, or like they're sitting there like that, looking at you and they're going, okay, oh, that's fine. And let it go. That's a complete cycle in the practice of forgiveness. One, two, three, not one, two. Okay. And we don't make lists in forgiveness. <laughs> one friend was put on forgiveness meditation. A couple of months later, checked in to see how the person was doing. Person said to me, oh, it's great. Great. I, I, I think I finished. What did, how'd it go? It was great. I made a list of all the people that I wanted to forgive. <laughs> and then I forgave them. And I, it just went great, she said. <laughs> and I, I said, well, did you, did you forgive yourself? And she said, well, why would I forgive myself? I didn't ever do anything wrong. The blind are sometimes blind, you know, and the, and the problem the, the, the gets the piece that gets stuck inside. You can't imagine that, but that's going to come back and come back and come back. You want to go through the whole cycle of this. It really does cleanse if you go through the whole cycle. So when you let's look at number three, is it Donna when they forgive you? Ah, it is, ex listen carefully, accepting from someone else something they are trying to give you is a form of giving to that person. That is where the Donna is. You are being generous by accepting a gift from someone when you are working on the third part of this practice. Do you get it? Okay. I hope you guys get that one. Okay. Now, if you're trying to, um, if you're trying this to fix the metta, the dana fixes the heart so that the metta will flow. That's the connection between forgiveness and the metta practice. This dana practice of forgiveness is fixing the heart. It didn't get softened by a systematic practice of dana before you started practicing and learning the uh, tranquil wisdom insight meditation. So now you're just trying to get in touch with the heart. And so it's a heart mind connection that you're working on. Okay. Now in the case of learning metta, when, uh, when do you use this? Well, I think I already covered that's where, okay. Number, the first one is number one, is uh, this is about the student when would they use it okay when when you get stuck um the student says to you my meta won't come up <laughs> my meta won't come up it won't work <laughs> you know, my meta is stopping what's wrong first you have to smile more you explain to them that the smile is an operational reason, like I did, and so the metta will work and it will become easier to smile in the practice. And why is because what you do in the present moment dictates what happens in the future. This is part of the lesson, what you think and you ponder on that becomes the inclination of your mind. That's in Sutta number, I think it's in 19. In, in Sutta number 19, the Dvaita Vitaka Sutta, okay? Uh, and that statement, he tried to make the monks understand what you're doing right now is creating how the rest of your day is going to go. It's that immediate. So if you're going to smile and through everything, it's going to be easier today through the whole thing, you see? If you, this isn't going well this morning. I don't like what's going on in the office this morning. <laughs> You're going to have a bad lunch, indigestion, and the afternoon is not going to go so well. That's how it works. Okay. Um, I was thinking about May, if she has like two or three piano students coming in in a particular day, and she has one that just won't 
follow the instructions. If she gets all caught up about that, it's going to be, you know, hard. And maybe she's smart enough to have the, you know, a really good one as the third one to just make her feel good about, how to, you know, have a beginner that just is, is there. That's helpful to have a beginner that's excited about starting. But then there's the middle one that the number two student that you told, I need you to do this scales this way with your fingers and they come and they're still doing it their own way with the fingers and that's what she looks like right <laughs> yeah but then afterwards she has somebody come in who can actually did their homework and and they uh can play what they're supposed to play and she feels really great okay <laughs> i know that's how it was with my voice students when i was teaching voice okay um Okay, how long does a person do this practice? How long should they be doing this practice? If you're in a retreat or for you're trying to fix your, um, well, let's say you're in a 10 day retreat with me, this two or three days in the retreat, the student will tell you that there's a problem and then they'll pick it up and they'll, uh, it clears up then they go back to work with the meta. It might be they hit one problem and they were able to, when they started the forgiveness meditation, that problem popped up. They worked it through pretty quickly and now they feel good. I want to go back and try the meta. Go ahead and let them try the meta. Let them go back and finish the retreat with the meta. And oftentimes the person removed the block away and it's going to run very well, okay? But the second person is like, ooh, ooh, they go like this. Ooh, that was so good when that worked. I really, really like this forgiveness stuff. Um, I like how it makes me feel, just out of curiosity, can I keep this forgiveness and use it for my practice for the whole retreat? And you know, if they want to do that, let them do it. Because if they were able to sit and start the forgiveness practice and someone fell out and they worked it through and went back, that means they're, they're attuned to allowing this to open and have something drop out. They're not going to have to wait two or three weeks for one person to come out. And I have had a student who really needed forgiveness, had to keep working on it for about three weeks before the, he would release one person to come out. And finally, when one person came out, he said, well, one person came out. Uh, we congratulated each other that we finally got everything in order so that one person came out. Then he said, last night, another person came out. I said, do you want to keep going? I do, I do. He was like, oh, this is working and it feels really good. I like it. I said, keep doing it. And it ended up with 11 or 12 things that came out and just was like taking this huge cleansing experience uh, in a special spa or something, you know, to just wipe this all away. And that is, that is what happened. Okay. Um, so if a person wants to keep it for their practice, it can be number two and they can do it. And then at which point you could volunteer to check in with them. And after your initial teaching them this, just be, be open to letting them check in with you to see if it's working the same way with other people that come out, if it's working okay. And be sure and let them know if you get you feel like uh, you get to a place where nothing is coming up. If you want to try to make your own statement, people make their own statements sometimes. Like I forgive myself for overeating, or I forgive myself for undereating, um, or I forgive myself for breaking. This is a good one. I forgive myself for making mistakes, and I forgive myself for breaking a precept. And another one is overthinking, overanalyzing. If you're doing too much of that in your practice, it's just bogging you down. Let me tell you something about that. People want to learn the twin practice. And sometimes they come and they were psychoanalysts or they were psychologists. They want to 
dig, 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 dig while they're learning. I don't suggest that at all. I suggest that you learn it and master how it operates and experience it. And then you have all the time for the rest of your life, you know, if you want to analyze it piece by piece, how it's working. But don't do it as you're trying to learn. Try to take the instructions. You should encourage people to take the instructions. And if it's not working, go back and read the instructions. And if it didn't work, read them again. Because the instructions, honestly, these instructions are not difficult. They're very specific for the most part. And I have thought about rewriting them better. But when I go back, it's a matter of you just are not doing this part of the instructions. So you take a highlighter and you go through a written out version of the instructions for Meta and you find out what it is you're not doing and then you do it. And as soon as you do it, it works, it works. So most, I've never run into a situation yet where it wasn't working, where it wasn't because there was something they were not doing in the instructions, but we covered a lot of it. Now, let me tell you something about those instructions. The instructions for Meta appear as 12 minute ones, but the 29 minute one is the one you wanna find. 30 minutes or 29 minutes, whatever it says. That is the complete loving kindness booklet. You want to listen to the 30 minute version and it's exactly 29 minutes and two seconds or something like that. And, and that I was listening to it. I, re, I read it and recorded it one time. You can listen to me read it to you or you can listen to Bonte say it. He knew it by heart and it was taken and typed out exactly the way he did it in all the retreats for 10 or 15 years. And that's exactly how he did it verbatim. And he didn't ever leave anything out. Don't wiggle, don't move, don't twist, you know. <laughs> you know, uh, there's another one. Anytime you want to change the truth, you want the truth to be different. You want it to be the way you want it to be. If you try to change the truth when it's the truth, then that is how you're going to suffer. You need to let things simply happen and you need to adjust and go with it naturally to do whatever needs to be done. Okay. Um, next question here, I think, um, uh, let's see. Okay, how long should, uh, for a person to um, come up? Okay, I just mentioned that briefly. It's up to you that you don't throw the person who's trying to come up for step two, for the second part of this practice. In other words, you're saying, I forgive myself for not understanding and you need a person to work on so that you can say, I forgive you for not understanding. And so uh, some people that'll happen right away and other people it will happen after a week, somebody will come up. But the big, the big thing is don't six R them. Just if you feel tightness in your head, you can relax and smile into this. I am not against smiling in this meditation. I think it's a good thing to be smiling. When you are smiling, you can still cry and you can cry with the acceptance you're smiling into your tears. You see, I don't think you should be crying with, <laughs> I don't think it should be like that. You can just drain your tears. That's an emotional hook on what I did a second ago emotionally exhausting myself. But listen, I was working with those men about 11 years ago or so in Germany. And, and these men were it's carrying, still carrying the guilt of what happened in World War II. And they were the grandchildren and great grandchildren of those people, okay? And this is a sad thing what happened after World War II. Okay, or any war, okay? And um, they were crying. They were crying. They were literally bawling their eyes out for almost, uh, you know, four, three or four days straight in a 10 day retreat. And we just let them cry and put a towel on their lap and give them lots of Kleenex, lots of tissues and cry for heaven's sakes. You have these ducks and drink a lot of water 
keep drinking water with keep your water beside you see that here it is i'm fasting uh-huh right mm, mm, mm. constantly keep drinking okay <laughs> okay so what you have to do is just um let it all out because that's what's giving you a headache. It's what's making you feel bad. It's what's making you feel tired. It's what's making your indigestion happen and you can't sleep. Simple, start smiling. You know, everything eases up a lot. Okay, the next one is what if, what if, um, if when I get to number two and a person comes up, this is the question one teachers had. And I have a person that I am forgiving and I realize the more I think about it, now you shouldn't be thinking about it. You should be just forgiving that person and saying, I forgive you for not understanding. You shouldn't be thinking about that whole event because what happens is then you say, and I didn't like what he did and I didn't like it at all. <laughs> you start thinking this was happening to me. I didn't like any of it. And as soon as you get mad like that, you're stuck. You're not just saying the phrase back to that other person. But this is where you have to stay with it. This is where it's between the men and the boys. This is where it's between the girls and the women. This is where the strength comes in. You have to forgive that person and feel this other stuff that is coming up around you. Let it all go. It's just story. And you know what? It's already dead. It lives back there. It's already died. It's over. It's fixed in time. And there is nothing you can do to change that. What happened, happened. And you can't change the color of it. You can't shape it a different way. You can't make it a different thing. So face the fact when something's passed that that's it. It's the last. It's done. You see? And you have to learn that all over again because we've watched so many people in our life suffer the other way and it's just draining so give it up and you take whatever it takes to get through this in number two level two you stick with it okay now if you really feel you're wearing yourself out step back to yourself for a minute and and give yourself some loving kindness okay and give yourself some loving kindness and then say the phrase for yourself again and then go back to that person, okay? And if you break your sitting and you're not done with number two, working with somebody, that doesn't mean you start all over again and let somebody else pop up. Uh -uh. You take a walk, okay, you take a walk. But when you come back, you jump in and you work with the same person and you work with them until you're done and you don't go on to another person. And some people don't like that, but I want to go on to the next one. I want to go on to the next one. No, no. This is the one that came up. This is the one that broke the fence and came out of the corral and fell out of your head. This is the one. The others are locked up still. So work with it. Make a commitment to work with it until it's done. Okay, walking. In forgiveness meditation, we do a couple things differently with our, our um, sitting time. We want you to work forgiveness in blocks of one hour times. We don't want you to just go on and on and on the whole afternoon, just forgiving, forgiving, forgiving. We want you to work one hour with this, uh, with it. And then um, when you break, Go for a walk. And while you're walking, I want you to practice a drill. This is walking to train the brain to forgive before anything else you do in life. So let me show you. When you're walking, it walks like this. Okay, here's the walking. He goes, you start on your right foot. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> okay. I forgive you and you forgive me. Got it? Right foot first. Right, that's right. Thank you very much. Okay, okay. <laughs> I forgive you and you forgive me. 
what if they're left-handed? Do you have to be so smart? <laughs> if you wanna start with your left foot, it's all right, but in the military, they make you start with your right foot anyway. Well, you could have said so, okay, all right, that's enough. Uh, so that's, what are we doing? This is a simple drill to train your brain to drill it, to get it to, so no matter what is happening towards you with a interaction, you will develop it into a behavior pattern where you forgive and then you apply compassion and use loving kindness in everything you do. That's what this is about. And it's keeping you in the framework of, I'm working with forgiveness meditation. Keep doing it. Why do you think that that will happen, Sister Kama? <laughs> because neurocognitive science tells us that the brain learns how to build behavioral neural pathways that are behavior patterns in your brain by doing something repeatedly the same way. So I'm teaching you to build a new neural pathway for the way you approach everything in life with forgiveness, just like that, forgiving it. You don't even know what it's about when people are talking to you in your face. My favorite one is, how are you doing? And everybody says, oh, I'm fine. <laughs> You have no idea what anybody means. Did they really mean how are you? Because they were walking by at about three miles per hour. <laughs> you know, and when you said, oh, I'm fine, do they really care? <laughs> it's like, this is crazy, you know, but, <laughs> you know, you, you're trying to get yourself to simply forgive and then comp apply compassion. Now let's look at compassion. I want you to understand compassion. There is an ag active compassion, such a thing as what I would call a, an active compassion and an, a stagnant, it's a, a more in, inactive compassion. Because you can be compassion, a, be compassionate a, a person, but if you're not doing an active compassion, it's different. So what's the active compassion here? When somebody comes into your face with something or they they start to yell at you, for instance, there's a few secrets you need to know about this. And always remember at first, if someone just decides to be ugly and nasty to you, they're not talking about you. Put that one in your file, okay? <laughs> they are not talking about you. They are criticizing themselves by say, being mean to you. That's a big difference there. So forgive them because they don't understand what they're doing. And the, you see the person, what you're doing is seeing the person in pain. This is the definition for compassion. One, see the person in pain. Number two, understand their pain is their pain and you cannot take their pain away. Number three, give the person the space to have their pain, to go through their pain. And number four, love them unconditionally. Make sure they have a place to sit or a place to lie down. Make sure if it's cold, they have a cover or a coat. Make sure that they have basically what they need. But you cannot take another person's pain away and fix them. This is the reality in life that has caused so much problem. I have to fix him. You cannot fix him. I have to change her. You cannot change her. You see, it doesn't work that way. The only way it can all work out is if there is a commonality and interest, a transparency between the two people and honesty and good conversation going back and forth, a sharing, a trusting, a respecting and trusting that's going on. And then you let it flow. And if the person hurts, you don't grab them and pat them on the back and say, don't cry, don't cry. Oh boy, don't tell Sister Kama that happened. <laughs> you tell them not to cry, you know what? 
then they can't let it out. And if they hold it in and they put it inside their body, things can happen that are not good. It can lead to all kinds of disorders, mental disorders and dis-ease of the mind and dis-ease of the body. That's the word disease. Did you know that? Dis-ease is the word for disease. It means no ease in the mind, no ease in the body. And it stores up in the body and it's can cause lots of problems. So twin practice is helping the mind to open up to what needs to be forgiven. Isn't it true? Because when we attempt to use loving kindness and we are looking at metta karuna mudita upeka, that's the framework for your Practice of Tranquil Wisdom Insight Meditation, okay? And that framework, metta, cancels out feelings of ill will. And karuna, the compassion, cancels out any thoughts of cruelty. And the mudita cancels out any thoughts of discontent. And the upaka, he cancels out the heavy duty aversion that we can develop towards things. It, it's not there anymore, it's just gone. And that's pretty much what I did this morning for about an hour and a half with these notes with them and came up with. Now, I wanna throw it open in, for questions now and then see what you come up with. And then we can maybe do a little bit more if we have time, okay? So let's, anybody have questions here about the, the metta and the forgiveness and how they work together? Hmm? Um, Jay. Mm -hmm. sister, how are you, Sister Kemma? Oh, I'm doing okay. okay. <laughs> I'm having a new kind of adventure. Okay. <laughs> Uh, my question is, uh, while we are, <clears throat> when we are sitting meditation, we are doing a um, loving kindness meditation practice. And thereafter, what do you, you are, do, do you advise that every time when you go for a walk, when you go from your apartment to a bus station or to a train station, you practice forgiveness meditation? No, 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 no. Okay. No. All right. Now you, you, if you're practicing forgiveness meditation, yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> If you're practicing loving kindness, I suggest that you send loving kindness to everybody all around you okay. and, and think of them. This is you're living in compassion bubble, but you 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 try living inside a meta bubble where yeah. you're smiling yeah. at, at people when they go by and not just walking by, but you know, you're smiling at them. And you'll find a strange thing happens when you're smiling when you're walking. Very strange. Yeah. People smile back at you. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Is, thank you. is there anything else? Yeah. No. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Okay. Benham, hello. Hi. Hello. I think How I think you? I owe you. I, I think I owe you an uh, an email. I actually believe I owe you an email. I didn't do the retreat. I had to cancel because of what happened with all of this and. Um, so I'm going to try to start uh, next Friday. I can still do it starting okay. next Friday. And so I, I will write to you about this, OK? But I'm only going to do it with a few people um, because it's, uh, it's just too much for me to do right now. <laughs> I have to rest too much, you know? OK? So what's your question? Um, question. Sometimes when I do forgiveness meditation, um, mm. I feel uh, kind of low. So I need to switch back to meta, then uh, again, switch back to no, forgiveness. No. no, these are not to be done together. These are not to be practiced together. Okay. If you, you said sometimes when you're doing forgiveness, tell me what you said again, what happens? I feel low, I feel depressed sometimes, you know, because of all the things that come up. And I think I need 
uh, no go to Meta to feel a little bit no, more higher. Going to Meta is not going to fix this. So if you, what is the, what it, when you're practicing forgiveness, what is the phrase that you are using? What phrase? I usually use the, I forgive you for not understanding or I forgive you for. All right. I forgive myself for not understanding things clearly, right? For not understanding things clearly. Okay. And then something comes up. When something comes up, somebody should be in that something, some person. Yes. And that person, if that, when that person, you're feeling the right way for forgiveness, you're actually feeling the correct way. You feel down, you fall down with the forgiveness a little bit when something starts to come up so that you find a person in your mind now if it was a bunch of people and if a bunch of things if something happened with a bunch of people the first person that comes in your mind is the person okay say there was something happened one time and there were six people involved that were being cruel to you or something but one person was the leader okay like that okay uh, then when that comes up in your mind, that event, you take that first person that comes up and you say, immediately see them in your mind. And then you keep going and you say, I forgive you for not understanding. You see, I forgive myself or I forgive myself for not understanding made this incident pop up in your mind. Now you say, I forgive you for not understanding. Now you keep working, you're on level two. You see what you just did, what you just did was, um, this is why the practices get mixed up. We feel pretty good when we're working with metta. So if we try forgiveness and we start to feel pressure low, pushing us down or feeling low about something, we wanna jump back and feel good about something, but you're just gonna be going like this and like that and like this and like that. It's not gonna heal anything. To heal it, you must go through the practice of forgiveness. It is not an easy practice. When I did it, I bawled my eyes out. I, I was crying sometime for more than an hour. This is before we stopped doing it for longer periods of time, I could do it for two hours and just fall my, cry my eyes out. And I had to be drinking lots of water and have lots of Kleenex and say out loud, I really do forgive you for not understanding. And you keep doing that and you let all the tears come out. You are washing, you are, you are cleansing yourself. That's what the cleansing is. Those men who were working in Germany, all 11 of them were sitting there crying in the Dhamma Hall. And this is a wonderful thing. They were just letting it all come out. And they were given, we made sure they had enough water, they had a towel in their lap, and they had tissues to work as hard as they could. And we counseled them every day. We met with them in an interview to check to see how they were doing. And this is progress. But if you go back over to the Meta, that's not anything. That's another problem. I'm, I can't do this. I'm going to leave this. Forget this. I'm going to go over here. When you come back to the forgiveness, the same thing is going to happen again. Same thing, I promise. You can't get out of it. So you need to remember that your personal reaction that is happening there is coming from the old event and you are uh, without clear understanding, you're thinking, oh, I'm living through this emotion again and it pulled me down. It hurt me before I'm going through it again. Guess what? You are not going through it again. See this, watch, I have new toys. <laughs> this, uh, this is the past back here, see? It's pretty good, isn't it? <laughs> That's the past. And this is the future over here, over here. And that what you are feeling emotional about and feel it's pulling you down is from an old event that's back here. Now, tell me something, Benham. What is true about the past? Is it finished? Yes, it is. 
And the event, the event that happened that hurt you in the past is the energy gone from that event. It's all used up, isn't it? Yes. It's dead in the past. So where that is sitting in the past, where this is sitting in the past, it's just like this chip. It's just in the past and it's just a note of the past, right? Yes. Okay. So when you think about it in the present, are you reliving the past? Sometimes it feels like that, that you know. Yeah, it feels that. like that. It feels like it, Benham, but you can't relive it because you're in the present. So it feels like the, the, the sense and the feelings of what happened, but what I want you to understand is that the present day energy is being used to, for this emotional feeling like was in the past. So what's feeding you to go through that is this, this energy bottle for today. This is my energy bottle. Yep. Okay. So, so are you going to give one third of this energy away today on something that is in the past. That's the problem here, see? Instead, you take the knowledge of the truth of how this is working and you stay with that person that came up and you look them right in the eye and you say, I forgive you for not understanding. The truth is, the truth about everybody on the earth is that we do the best we can do in a given situation with the information that we have, understanding it the way we are understanding it at that time. It wasn't right what happened. It wasn't good what happened. And we, we always feel like this is all happening to us, but we have a choice how to receive it because the truth is everything is happening from us which is a deeper lesson nothing happens to us i know you've been through some tough times i've had many students like this and in the same situation and when things happen to us in bad situations we have a choice what to do and you think well i don't know what i mean well there was a monk called Gosananda. We'll talk about Venerable Gosananda in a minute. During the period of the Khmer Rouge inside of Cambodia, Pol Pot was horrible. The things that he was doing, and tremendously cruel, and the police and the restrictions and stopping people from development and all everything that was going on. It was absolutely horrible. And the military came to the village where Gosananda was. And they told them they were going to kill everybody in that village. And then they put them in one house together, 35 of them, he said, 35 people, in a little tiny house. And the military was outside, said they're going to execute them. And then when they came in and told them they were going to start killing people, they grabbed an old man and Gosananda got up and said, don't take him, take me. Well, the captain was really angry in the face. They one thing they don't want you to do is say, take me instead of him. Made him really mad. He thought, I'm gonna make an example out of this. So he took Gosananda and he hooked him on the ceiling. On the ceiling. And they put a fence to hold him up on the ceiling. And they said, nobody is to help him. Nobody is to feed him. Nobody is to give him any water or anything. But in the dark, they would sneak a crust of bread. They would sneak something for him, some water to survive. And he hung there without any clothes on the ceiling. And he came in every day to check on him and he was still alive. He wouldn't die on the ceiling. Finally, these people, they gave up. They wouldn't kill the people 
the people they knew that those people were supporting him something happened in the situation and they left and didn't kill those people the point is afterwards the people took him down and said what were you thinking while you were on the ceiling what were you doing he said i was forgiving them and sending loving kindness was forgiving them. He was practicing compassion for the soldiers. He knew they didn't want to be there. He knew they were controlled by the government. He knew this was happening. You see, he was doing that the whole time. This was almost like about a five to seven day period that they had him like that. It was horrible. Then he becomes a monk and goes back and tries to rebuild the monks in Cambodia because Pol Pot took all the monks and killed them. He took everybody who had glasses, they, he killed them. When they found the piles of skulls, when they found where Pol Pot's people were taking them to kill them, the educated people had completely been wiped out. It was a pile of skulls and a pile of glasses. And then they began to understand this man was crazy. He thought that he could control the people as long as they were not educated. And his dream was to rebuild the Khmer Rouge, but that would never happen. But the important part is Gosananda. In that situation with so much pain, you know, and scratched up and held to the ceiling, all he did in order to survive was fill his heart with forgiveness and fill his mind with forgiveness and compassion and loving kindness. You see, when things happen that are really bad to us, we get scarred, it hurts us. It tosses us around in life. We have to relocate. We have to do all kinds of things in order to be able to do the things that we know we're good at and we want to help people. And most of these regimes in the world that are, you know, very strong types of regimes that want to control people completely play on the fact that the people do not have knowledge about how things work. They have never been told nothing has to happen to you. Everything is coming from you. You formulate the opinion. Gosananda knew these people had a pure heart and understanding how did they were going to survive was to be soldiers under this government and to follow orders as a soldier. And it goes on and on. They're trying to do the best that they can do with the information they have the way they understand it. And he forgave them. He forgave them all. There's another woman in New York I spoke to who went through that period who forgave them. Once they forget, he forgave them all. Then she was free. Gosananda was free. He was a great teacher as a monk. So when something comes up from before that happened, what it is, is you see the person in your mind, you got re-stimulated. You had a memory that tapped into your system, your mind, and your heart to something, and the feeling started to play again. That's actually good in forgiveness, because then you you let that go. You say, this is not me. This is not mine. This is not myself. This is just a re-stimulation of the past. This is just this piece trying to be some other color instead of red and in the past, it wants to be green and be in the present. <laughs> you know, that's all this is. And you train your mind. We are not victims. It's a big statement today in psychology and psychiatry and everything all over the globe. Human beings are not victims. We are powerful if we are given the proper knowledge of how our minds and our bodies operate we can learn what to do by staying in the present time. And when you're working with forgiveness, you don't cop out and go over to loving kindness. You went to forgiveness because you were having trouble with loving kindness progressing. So when you're in loving kind uh, forgiveness, nobody said it was going to be easy. Some of the people I had to forgive were unforgivable, <laughs> you know, but 
forgive them. They're not here anymore. You're not going to face them again. They're not going to come and hurt you, but they have scarred you from the scarring has happened inside is caught and you want to let it out. So you put a sign up past future. I'm going to live in the present. Look how light that is. So, so here's the future. Whoa. And here's the past. Yikes. You know, but here's, here's the present day. The present day today is like this. It's not heavy. It's little tiny thing. See? So if you have a lot in your past, here's something else to remember. If you have a lot in your past, that's a backpack. That's what you're carrying around with you. You take that off and you put it on a hook and leave it there. Oh, but you still have a front pack on. That little day pack is on the front. You have to take that one off over your head and you have to hook it next to the backpack on the wall. Now go out for today. When you leave here, go out today and have one day at a time where you live in the present time. Don't struggle to be in the present moment or minute right now. Just enjoy the flowers and enjoy the outdoors and enjoy, find a place you can take your shoes off and go put your foot in a stream and don't let anybody tell you you're too old to do that. <laughs> you're an adult, but you should be able to go tickle your toes on the beach and make a sandcastle, or you should be able to, to definitely, you should be able to, um, <clears throat> to, um, take your shoes off and find a stream and just put your feet in and just hang out with that. You see? And when you're walking, you just walk. I forgive you. You forgive me. I forgive you. You forgive me. And what is the outcome of that? The outcome is a new pattern of behavior was for me more than anything. I think that resembles um, forgiving, forgiveness, compassion, and loving kindness. See? Forgiveness pops up why not forgive? Because it's going to go in the past. And this place, this closet over here is just full of these. You know? So it's going to go in the past. There it goes. <laughs> okay. There it goes. It goes in the closet. But it was a good experience. You smelled the flowers. You smelled the roses. You, you ran on the grass. You ran on the grass. You see? So... You felt the grass in your toes. And that sort of thing is getting in touch with the earth. When something really bad happens to you, I'll tell you something. When your mind gets caught on something that's really, really bad that's happened to you, it's time to reconnect with the earth. We are earthbound beings. You need to take your shoes off. You need to get someplace where you can walk on the ground where it's safe. There's not a bunch of glass or stuff, you know and find a set of grass where you can walk on the grass with your bare feet. You need to do that. That doesn't work. Well, I can give you some other crazy things to do. <laughs> I mean, you know, you can go uh, find a place where you can dig a hole and take a couple buckets of water and sit in the hole and cover yourself with mud. That works great. Takes all the tension, all the tightness out of your body. But most people aren't willing to quite go that far. They're not as crazy as me, <laughs> you know, but that's what they used to do at the turn of the century, the 1800s, you know, the 1800s, they had these health spas. They had these big tubs of warm, wet mud baths. And you would go there to cover yourselves with the mud. Why? Because you were reconnecting with the mother, with the earth. You were reconnecting with who you are an earthbound being, see? So don't, don't mark that off. Just forgive, compassion, smiling, loving kindness. Try it for a day, okay? But don't you, you don't have to give up. It's not gonna hurt you. It may feel like it pulls you down. So you counter it by doing what I'm telling you, okay? Try it for a couple of days, okay? You let me know what happens. I, I promise you, I will write you this week. I have a bunch of things to do tomorrow, but I will do it by Tuesday, okay?
Thank you, okay. no worries. Okay, <laughs> okay. Okay, any questions? Any other questions? Ah, it's you. <laughs> Hello. Uh, hello. Good morning, Sister Kiba. Uh, not so much a question, but just something that uh, when I was working with forgiveness, I found very helpful um, was sometimes to do it lying down and uh, to lie on something which opened up my heart. Mm -hmm. So just uh, like a rolled up towel. So I'd lie and, and my chest would then open up because it was the towel was down my spine. Uh, and that just kind of gave a, a, a physical cue to what the process was mentally and emotionally as well. Yeah, a lot of attention. Uh, our attention is tight in our spine and our spine connects to all of our the rest of our body and, and has a lot to do with our emotions. And uh, when we're working with stuff that is pent up inside of us, this is very true. So lying down is certainly permitted when you're doing this. You can be anywhere, anytime, doing almost anything. I mean, I used to go out in the forest and sit under a tree or climb up in a tree house, <laughs> you know, to do those sessions when back then. And um, lying down is fine. Finding a big rock or finding an open cliff, making sure that nobody else lives under it. <laughs> you have to make sure there's nobody else that's living underneath where the overhang is. And just even staying there during a rainy day, you know, and just continually working on this lying down is not a problem. You, you can sit or sit in a chair, but don't, don't let yourself be sitting in such a comfortable. I had a friend, I asked her to do this, you know, and I asked her to meditate you. And she said, wrote, called me back. She said, well, I meditate. I said, how did it go? Oh, it was great. It only took me five minutes to fall asleep. I was sitting in this space chair. <laughs> And the kids, her children had had measured her body and everything and had a space chair from NASA made a space chair and they gave it to her. And she, I said, don't sit in this space chair. It's not good for your, your, for your, your um, posture. You're supposed to at least sit up straight, you know. But then I said, if you're doing loving kindness, where is the space chair? Go and get the space chair. You know, because it was absolutely comfortable for her and designed for, I don't know, 20 G's or something, just in case <laughs> she took off. <laughs> yeah, but that's a great suggestion. You got anything else, you? Um, no, I, I, I liked uh, your talk because uh, it just pulled some threads together from uh, some of the things that you've said in the past around uh, forgiveness um so that was yeah that was really nice good i was trying to and i thought the best way was to ask these guys a bunch of questions so they were what their questions were anybody else have any questions about the practice yeah may uh sister came if i may thank you so much um mm -hmm. i concur with hugh it, uh, that your talk today was really pulling all the bits and pieces about forgiveness you talked about before um, so thank you. Um, just a quick question, because I have been practicing this for a while. And yeah. um, um, interestingly, um, so I um, like the tiniest thing will make me laugh. The tiniest thing will make me cry nowadays. It's, it's almost as if I'm alive again. That's not the right way to put it. Anyway, the question is, and I don't know if this question will make sense, but when the walls all come down, uh, wouldn't the heart be vulnerable again to hurt is the question. And I don't know if it makes sense, but I'm trying to. Sure, sure, it makes sense. Okay. I think the heart is a wonderful organ. And I think that the Buddhist, uh, the whole Buddhist practice and everything is not just based on mind, but it is a mind heart practice. I, in fact, named a named a teaching heart mind heart mind meditation <laughs> you know where the heart is connecting that into balance with the mind doing it now the the question is the reason why did the heart get hurt before so badly 
is because of the lack of knowledge. And so what you're really talking about is the difference between living as a human being in ignorance and how seriously hurt the heart can get when you're living in ignorance of how the human being works, how the, the mind is operating, how the mind and emotions are working, how feeling is not emotion, all of these pieces coming together. Now, this is important because sometimes we don't have, uh, the, when we're working with TWIM, if we have worked with anything else, one of the things that happens is there's difficulty because we don't have some primary primary uh, definitions clear to work with. Let's talk about this just for a minute. Like, for instance, what is meditation? Meditation, uh, uh, the way we're, we have seen the Buddha put it together. Meditation is observing the movement of mind's attention as it moves moment to moment, object to object without us asking it to. And it always is arising and passing away, arising and passing away. But you're what you're beginning to understand the, how the um, the movement of mind's attention, object moment to moment, object to object, for the purpose of seeing clearly, understanding the four noble truths, dependent origination or dependent co-arising. That's human cognition, and the, the um, three characteristics. So when these things come together properly, it isn't necessary to have a program just on the three characteristics because when you learn dependent origination, you will learn very deeply the truth of the three characteristics. So the three characteristics, what are they? Anicca, dukkha, and anatta. So anicca means impermanence, everything that arises passes away. There is continual change that is happening. Part of the reason for our suffering is because we want to grab a hold of some moment and keep a hold of that, but everything is flowing, you see? Instead of living through that moment, coming and going, like those moments going by, we want to grab the moment that was just so great and hold on to it and make it stay the same way. And we can't do that because of Anicca. So this is a natural uh, characteristic of existence. Okay, the dukkha, the dukkha, because everything is changing, the dukkha is set off by our unsatisfactoriness with this change. Okay, and that dukkha is I wanted it this way, I don't want it that way, or I want to make this stop, I don't like it, I want to make it stop. And the dukkha revolves around um, craving, is causing that dukkha, and the craving, the tanha craving is having to do with me personally. I like it, like we have a feeling come up that's painful, or like pleasant feeling, I like it, it changes very quickly in from I like it into I want it and attachment and there I go. M trying to make that feeling stay the same way, but I can't do it. And then I have to flip over to I don't changing. So I don't like this. I don't want this. And now I have aversion to it. So now I'm going to have to try to make it stop. That's uh, that's why our whole life is going whoop, 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 <laughs> like this constantly. It's like, it's the way life feels. Until when? Until somebody explains all this, okay? So this is the first part of it is what is the meditation. And the purpose of it is to understand the four noble truths where there is suffering, but it nobody ever said everything is suffering, including the Buddha, and that is incorrect Dhamma, if somebody tells you all life is suffering, that's not it. That wasn't his message. Life has suffering in it. There is suffering, was what he said. This first noble truth means. 
The second noble truth is there is a cause of the suffering. And he spent six and a half years trying to figure this out. You don't have to beat your head against the wall if you start reading what he found. But what he found is in certain places, that's what I'm for. I'm a conduit, a guide, trying to show you what we found when we went to find out what he found out about the cause, okay? So the cause of suffering is the second one. The third one is there is a cessation. Now, everybody knows, everybody remembers sometime that you were happy. You, you felt everything was really nice. And you had you were happy about something, so there is a cessation of suffering. He knew that, and he want his quest was to take these three pieces and develop a way to expand the third noble truth to a path that leads to the cessation of suffering, and you can have it and use it in life more often. How do you do that? By learning how things actually work. How do you do that? Okay, the second question, what is the, um, good, I'm good. <laughs> That's, I said, what is, what, is the medita what is the meditation? What is, or I'm sorry, what is mindfulness? What is mindfulness? Mindfulness is the tool that he used. It is observation tool was mindfulness. That's a simple answer. You don't want to beat around the bush to figure this out. He had a set of questions he had to figure out. How is he going to watch it? He's going to watch it through his meditation. That's how he's going to watch it occur. So this was his mindfulness was the observation tool. So the, the meditation was observing it for the purpose of seeing X, X, and X. Now we have the tool. Meditation is the tool, okay? The next one, the next word that's kind of a key word is um, um, delusion, delusion. And delusion gets confused. The, word, the delusion, the delusion is the false idea that everything is about me. And if we were to support the idea that everything is about me, we would have a very selfish, self-centered, narcissistic world. And we would never have freedom and have free governments or peace or anything to even have space to develop. You know, we have a lot of mistakes right now we have to overcome with a lot of things we've tried. But we're in a period of great change right now, great change and great hope for the future. New things are coming. New things are possible still. There is hope for the future. We are powerful as human beings. We must understand how wars begin in order to have peace. We must start to really understand the nature of how they start and look at the potential human beings have not to do them before we can have peace. We cannot have peace conferences about peace all the time that produce nothing because we never will stop long enough to discuss how these two, who be, yeah, and you yeah, me. get in war with each other. <laughs> we have to start to understand how I get in war with Benham and Benham gets in war with me, okay, before Benham can look at this group of people and decide about that. And then his neighbors and then his, his town, his village, his town, his country, his continent. It's absurd. Human beings have the total, complete potential and knowledge for peace. We don't want to share it with our young people and we don't want to give them the truth. We have to let go of it now and let them see how the human beings work, not just in expensive prep schools that get access to this kind of information. And I know this for a fact, but public schools do not get information about mathematics, financial things, and psychology that are discovered. Okay, that's my political thing for today. <laughs> it's not fair. This is universal humanitarian information and we have the potential to have peace. You know, do you know that at the year 2000, that we had the knowledge and the skill and the technology to feed and house and clothe people on the entire earth. I want you to think about that a minute because we didn't do it. 
And we probably won't for still a while until people put their foot down and say, we have to do it. Now I'm sitting in a country that decided it was going to do it. And the, you know, I'm in Poland and the Ukrainians are, came here because they had nowhere to go. And I don't really care what happened. These people had to have a place to go. And they're here and this country opened its arms to these people because it had a mutual linguistic connection too, you know? So that's part of all this whole thing. It's part of the whole thing. So May, what was I talking about before I got political? <laughs> um, you were talking about the definitions of meditation, mindfulness, and oh, delusion. Good. Okay, so delusion, delusion is the false idea. It's all about me. You have to let that go. If that's where you're stuck, spend a week without yourself. <laughs> spend a week doing everything with the other person first and forgiving everything that you're concerned about, just forgiving it because they don't know what they're doing. They don't understand. And they, they don't, uh, they're not understanding things clearly either. It's not just me saying that in forgiveness. The world is saying that right now because things have been held back. The next one's craving and craving is all the problem of thinking it's all about me. I crave. You want peace, you have a choice. To crave and cling, to, you want suffering, you have a choice. To crave and cling or not to crave and cling, that is the Buddhist question. Shakespeare, to be or not to be, okay? To be emotionally or uh, reactive or not to be emotionally reactive. If we took being, you know, and we said to be, <laughs> and we applied it to what he said in that phrase, to be or not to be, the, that is the question. It's one of the lines from Shakespeare. We would say in our teaching, we would say to be reactive or not to be reactive. That is the question. But, you know, what would King Lear or some of those other plays be like if there was no reaction? I mean, nobody would kill anybody. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it wouldn't be very interesting. Just like opera, what would you do if everybody, if if the if the soprano always got the lover, you know, and always got the baritone? <laughs> the, the, you know that sopranos. The reason, one of the reasons I didn't want to continue with opera training was because someone said, "Why did you quit?" I said, "Because we always die." <laughs> I mean, come on, look at the opera. You're singing the opera. And she's going, oh, 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 oh. and all of a sudden she dies. She falls off a cliff. I mean, she falls off the house. She dies. She kills herself because she can't have the man she loves. This is too much. Absolutely too much. Too much. Oh, my gosh. Difficulty. Difficulty. So now we got up to, we got it, uh, meditation. What's it for? And the mindfulness. And we've got delusion and we got craving and craving sets off everything because of this, I want it, I don't want it. Push, pull, push, pull, push, pull. If you, you think you're tired now, think about yesterday and all the times you went push, pull, push, pull. <laughs> I want coffee, we're all out of it, I'm sorry. <laughs> I want coffee, ice cream. No, there's none, only chocolate and vanilla. <laughs> goes on constantly right that's crazy okay now we get past craving we have the two pieces that are actually fixing you and we have to have those in our practice the two pieces that are fixing us is first we have to purify the mind and second of all we have to retrain our mind and yes it is possible that people can change for sure, nobody is stuck. Even the leaders in the world, they are not stuck. They cannot sit there and say, but I always do it this way. At some point, humans have to get to a point they understand we are powerful enough to change. One of the things Fanti said to me, you know, about purification and retraining of mind, those are the last two in the steps you do in tranquil wisdom insight meditation you recognize the unwholesome mind state that's recognizing that you have to be purified you release 
the the unwholesome mind state and relax. That's purifying the mind. The next one is to bring up a wholesome mind state and the fastest one to uplift the mind and sharpen awareness is to smile. That's the fastest one and the most secure one. It's always there. You can always do it. You just <laughs> like that. It's this muscle, okay? That's retraining the mind to stay uplifted and open, which gives you the space to do what? To forgive and apply compassion and loving kindness. And that's the retraining session. And so whatever it was the Buddha was doing, whatever it was he was practicing has to have those components in it in order to actually change the person. That's what it is. Okay? So recognize, release, relax, re-smile, return, repeat. And recognize, release, relax, re-smile, return, repeat. Come on. Recognize, re-smile, release, relax, re-smile, return, and repeat. That's your job. Okay? Any other questions? <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> we, I think it's a good line dance. I think it can be a line dance. Don't you? <laughs> Back and forth. Can I ask another question? Oh, yeah. OK, Benna? Mm -hmm. uh, you said you shouldn't uh, stay in present moment. And recently, I was reading Yoniso Namaskara, I think. Uh, that Buddha uh, talks about paying attention to wholesome feelings and thoughts. Uh, but it is very hard for me, you know, to stay with the uh, present moment as if I'm addicted to thinking all the time. Outside meditation, it's like uh, one thought after another. And I try to stay, you know, with uh, what is here, but then I'm lost again. and. I, I become tense and tired. Nobody and... said this was going to be easy. I had a woman come to a retreat one time, and every night she would ask the same question after hearing a whole Dhamma talk, which explained to her, how do you change? What I just described with you is how do you change? Does it mean that you do it and it happens automatically very quickly? No, no. When I came into this practice, I was 50 years old. Okay. It didn't come easy. <laughs> I have taught 20 year olds that it comes pretty easy and children that it comes extremely easy. And I taught some nuns who kept their precepts for six years. So it came really easy to them. But how old are you? If you're 37, 38 years old for 37, 38 years, you know, you've been reacting this way. You see, now it's time for you to take charge and stop letting your mind push you around. Right now, your mind at this stage of the development of the, of the meditator in the beginning, the mind thinks it's in charge of everything, everything. Not everything in your body, it is your heart, your liver, your stomach, your digestion is connected, all connected to the mind. It's true, it's the control center. But mind has another job. Mind has always believed since you were a little boy that its job is to protect you from anything that would threaten you or cause you to have any kind of um, a breakdown or any kind of um, shock in, a, in a, a bad situation, the shock of something hurt you and it can shut you, it protects you. It's supposed to be in charge. And it has gotten kind of out of order, your mind. When we're older, it thinks it's supposed to be running everything. This is where we got the traditional belief people can't change because the mind is just like been trained and that's how it's going to be. But then 12 years ago, we found out different. We found out that you can retrain the mind for real in the science is proven. 
you have a, a, a thick one like this that says every time I feel a little upset, I should do something to make myself happy. So you don't want to do the forgiveness all the way through. But you have to take a hold of that practice, say, I'm going to work it through until it's finished. It's not easy. You might have to work on that person that pops up. And when that incident pops up or that person pops up and it makes you feel bad, you might feel bad that way every time you sit down, but you have to change it. You are in charge of changing it. Do you understand? Okay, the mind is not in charge. You're surrendering to the mind saying, well, I just keeps happening to me, happening to me. And I'm trying to explain something to you. You stick around me long enough, you're going to understand it's not about what anybody's doing anything to you. It's about how you decide you are going to go out and make your life operate. Nothing is happening to me. All 72 years, nothing ever happened to me. Everything happened from me based on my understanding of how things worked. And a lot of it felt like it came down on me. And it oppressed me and I became distressed with tension, with tightness, with fear, with depression, all kinds of stuff. I had a serious breakdown at 41. Serious. I was in the hospital for over 20 days before I could even walk around and move. It was such a break. I broke. How come? It turns out it broke because I didn't understand I had anything to do with it. I thought it was all my mind in charge. And someone comes along like a monk and says, you know, nothing ever happened to you. I thought, he's insane. <laughs> of course, something happened to me, but it didn't. I responded the way I was trained to respond. I didn't know I had any power in choosing how to live. That's where we begin. Then we have to learn that when we change our perspective, nothing is happening to me, everything is happening from me. And nothing is personal. Nothing has ever been personal. I didn't have to get on the defensive and defend myself. I could have watched if I had more understanding of what was happening. I could have forgiven and had compassion to see those people suffer who were yelling or screaming at me or doing other things, you see? And I could have been involved with loving kindness, but I didn't know. I didn't know. That's what you come here for is knowledge. And then we show you how to see how it works by explaining how it operates. So that's knowledge and vision of seeing the effect of how it works for your life and changes things, yeah? You have a choice. You go back and you sit in your meditation. When something comes up, you start to feel sad. You dive right into it and you quit your meditation and go lie down and get depressed. You can do that. I worked with one system one time. She said it very simply. We have two choices in life. We can either laugh or cry. I thought that was kind of strange. If we cry, then we get feeling sick, depressed, can't eat, can't sleep. And we get red in our face from the tears and no one wants to be around us and we're down constantly and we're stuck alone. And all of this stuff is happening, we feel like to us. But if we smile and we remember our friend Anicha, Anicha, that's me, Anicha, is Anicha, Anicha is always there, I'm always there, <laughs> always, always there, <laughs> I know you're always there, <sighs> Anicha is telling you all the time, if you don't like that feeling, it can change, I change everything, <laughs> I know you do, and Nietzsche causes suffering, but at the same time, if you remember everything's going to change, if I'm here, then everything will change and it's just fine. <laughs> you see? And Nietzsche is with you all the time. 
you get a little note, you write Anicca, put it in your pocket. As soon as you feel like you're getting depressed, pull it out. And then everything's going to change in 10 minutes because you're going to start laughing. <laughs> Anicca is there. So you do just the opposite of what you're feeling. You make some tea. Whatever you like to do, you do. Reading, writing, uh, you know, take a walk, paint a picture, go out and get some chalk and draw on the sidewalk. That'll shock people. <laughs> Don't worry, the rain washes it away. Don't get the indelible type. You'll get in trouble. <laughs> Don't, don't paint the wall. <laughs> okay. You do you understand? Yeah? Yes. It's it's yes. me. I'm in charge. I'm not not in charge, but I thought all my life I was not in charge. So I don't I understand what you're feeling like. Embrace the contradiction of when something's pulling you down, just start smiling and laughing at. Let me ask you a question. Look at it this way. If you were practicing forgiveness and you started to practice forgiveness and the feeling of down feeling started coming up. The question is, did you ask that to happen? No, did you I ask? Didn't. You no. didn't stop, did you? you? You didn't ask. You just started paying attention to that feeling instead of paying attention to forgiving. So you didn't go on. You didn't let that go and relax and keep forgiving. You that, that you, you see the problem with the hindrances if you pay attention to it, and that was a hindrance. If you pay attention to the hindrance, you're feeding the hindrance nutriment. And so then if you start paying attention, when, let me ask you this, when you started paying attention to that, what did you do? You ran away to, to the meta instead, but that's a different practice. And I'm telling you, practice this through. Look at what it is that caused you to feel depressed. Look closely at what that is that you are saying, I forgive you for not understanding, say it louder, say it louder, I forgive myself for not understanding. And that thing that is there, I forgive you for not understanding. And don't ever get mad at yourself when you fall down. It's just, you fell down, now you stand up and start walking again. <laughs> That's all it is. Yeah, I'm getting a lesson with that now. Sometimes I don't do so well when I'm trying to get around. Okay. So, okay. That's what you do. Okay. Okay. Thank you have you. to remember, you say, I am in charge. I am in charge of where my mind is going to go. You're letting your mind push you around. And another thing I told you, mind is taking care of you a lot. And it's like a little child, that's its job. It does not wanna be threatened. It does not wanna feel like it's going to lose its job. So when your mind pushes at you to feel down and depressed, what I want you to do is just talk to your mind for a sec. Look, I'm not threatening you. I just wanna know how this works. So you don't have to make this pop up, this, this uh, down feeling anymore. Just, I promise you, I just wanna see how things work. I'm not threatening your occupation, mind. I mean, you, you've been in a job 20 years, 37 years. I'm not threatening your job. I'm gonna help you because if I understand how things are working, everything will be better. That's what you're doing with your mind, see? And mind will slow down. It won't, it won't throw stuff up as much that way. If you talk to it a little bit, don't be afraid to talk to your mind. I don't suggest you do it in a restaurant, but, <laughs> you know, but, but when you're home, take a walk with your mind and talk to it all you want. It's okay. Your mother is not here anymore, probably. She's not going to say you can't have a secret friend. So you can just talk to your mind all you want. Okay? Okay? Okay. <laughs> Okay, are we okay here? Any other questions? Hmm. Okay, well, I'm glad we had a few people coming in today who wanted to know about this for a long time. And I hope that we answered some of the questions and I promise you that I will put together some pages. You know, I will type them out about the questions that we went over and we talked about today. And I think this went pretty well. It's probably longer than it was meant to be, but I don't know <laughs> what's new, <laughs> you know? <laughs>
and maybe we can figure out a way to take the politics out. Just take it out. <laughs> you know, I should have a big sign, world peace, yes, war, no, and that's it. You know, I just do that from now on when I start to talk like that, maybe Dama Kavesi can go, peace, yes, war, no, and then I can stop. <laughs> It's just something that keeps happening. I just really want to get that across before I'm gone. <laughs> okay, here we go. Let's say a prayer at the end. Okay. May, May suffering, suffering ones be suffering and free. suffering free and the and fear struck fearless be. May the grieving, may the shed, grieving all. shed all grief and may, and may all, all beings find, find relief. relief. May all beings may all be share this merit that we have thus Fired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting, May beings inhabiting space, space and earth, earth uh, devas and nagas, mighty power, power share, share this, this merit of ours. May they long, May they long protect the, the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Lost the other bow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you ran away. <laughs> okay, I'll see you all next week. Okay. Bye bye. Tomorrow, uh, Monday, we have this uh, 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 trust meeting at seven. Monday, tomorrow. Trust meeting. So it's at four o'clock, right? Yeah. About three thirty, I think. So three.